Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Alvarez. Thank you, Mikhail. Have fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a weird experience on the stage for the first time. But today, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to have an incredible experience because we have some fantastic panelists. We have Julia Denny from Growth Engineering. We have Will Stewart-Jones from Free Radical and Munch Lamb from Self Driven. And I will let them introduce themselves because they know their stuff a lot better than I will ever be able to know how, what, what they're doing. So can you give us a very quick intro into what you're, where you're at, what you're doing, what your companies are doing? Yeah, so um, I'm from the team from Growth Engineering. So hello, my fellow growth engineers out there. Um, and what we do <coughs> is we try and help large corporates in the main mm -hmm. um, make their um, online learning a lot more exciting. And so our, our focus is not only gamification, but also uh, social and also kind of narrative. So we, we try and basically put in the, the learning infrastructure for large corporates like HP, uh, BT, to try and get people to love their learning. That's fantastic, and that's what we're here for, to love what we're doing, right? <laughs> so Will, yep. how's 3 Radical? <clears throat> yeah, great. So yeah, 3 Radical, those of you that don't know, uh, we're a, a SaaS gamification software provider. So. Um, we've come from a marketing background, marketing heritage, so we're trying to bring gamification initially to, to marketing customer engagement. Uh, now, uh, one of the things we might talk about, um, finding, I guess, inbound requests uh, to also apply that in a B2B space as well. So, really excited to be here, looking forward to some exciting questions. We will, and because most of those questions will be coming from you, hopefully. So, Munch, how about self-driven? What can you say about all it? All right, all right. Thanks, uh, <laughs> Rob. Um, I'm Munch from Singapore. So um, Self Driven is actually a gamification platform company that we started in 2015. So we have been building our customer base in Asia since then. Um, starting this year, we have also uh, have a few customers on board in Europe as well. So I think there's a very interesting comparison between um, how customers uh, behave and what they expect in Asia versus Europe. That's fantastic, and that's going to be certainly one of the topics. And, and something uh, to get started with, with questions, with a lot of content, which is what we're all here for as well, is I, 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 we've seen the presentation as well from Marigo where she was talking about where we were 10 years ago, where we, we are now in many ways. But what have you seen since then that it, gamification has been seen as a fad at some point, but where even if some things have gone right or wrong, we're here. I mean, there, there's a conference about gamification, a, a vibrant community that I've been, been able to witness, especially through, through the podcast and the daily work that I do. How have you seen the industry in these, if you've been 10 years or, or, or even less, how have you seen the industry progress or what has been happening in this, these 10 years and where do you see the, the industry now? I mean, just in terms of what we're seeing in the learning space, obviously there was a, a big you know, leap into some very kind of basic gaming mechanics being put on learning management platforms. And, um, you know, largely that didn't really work. Um, and I think clients, you know, failed to sort of get, you know, the excitement and the engagement from their learner population. However, you know, speaking from a sort of a, a, a growth engineering kind of perspective, I think what we're generally seeing now is, is that the client base is much more informed with regards to the fact that gamification is more than just badges and leaderboards. And in order for it to effectively work, there needs to be multiple different mechanics going on, but there also needs to be a narrative that's weaved so that you can get that consistency of training. And then finally, gamification doesn't really work without social. And so, you know, if you don't have all of those things, you know, pulling together. So I would say that, you know, it, it, it definitely is improving, but I think there is a, a, a better understanding of, of our client base um, and corporate clients out there that it's not quite as simple as they once thought. Um, but a well, you know, really well deployed, you know, gamified platform can make massive differences in terms of engagement and, you know, really kickstarting that learner culture. So when done right, it's, you know, very powerful. But Changes lives, for sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Will, what, what about you? What have you seen as, I don't know, beyond the trends and, and in your experience, what have you seen? How has it changed the, the perception? And what yeah, abso absolutely. So <clears throat> I guess a bit of background. So, so Three Radical w was born out of another organization that did traditional digital marketing, so email and, and, and social and, 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 and direct mail, all, all that sort of good stuff that people were doing 10, 15 years ago. 
And we really came into the space uh, to say, could we actually boost the engagement rates? Uh, because you know, if you did it, even if you did an email campaign very well with data, you might achieve maybe five or seven percent response rates. So we really wanted to take it. We didn't even really realize it was gamification at the time, but we wanted to make something that would be more engaging that would really boost those engagement rates. And, and I guess what we have seen over the, I mean, I've been with the company getting on for five years now, is, is over that time, uh, we've definitely seen a sort of validation of this as an approach. We, all the companies that we go into now say those traditional marketing te uh, techniques that are dropping off, so you know, open and click-through rates for email are, are really sort of suffering. So um, we are definitely seeing now more inbound requests for us. So in the past, it was very much selling to sort of innovators or mavericks in organizations. So it's obviously quite difficult to pinpoint who those people are. Do they have enough influence to actually sign on the dotted line? So we're definitely seeing that coming in uh, and seeing great results. Um, and I guess the other thing that's kind of interesting is although we came from a marketing space, definitely seeing a lot, a lot more inbound requests from us to apply gamification in, in other verticals, so B2B, in learning, in staff development. So, so that's really the, the sort of trend that we've seen. So whereas before we were evangelizing, uh, as Juliet said, um, audience is much more informed now. We're actually getting sort of people coming to us um, to, to drive engagement. So that's a very, very positive outlook. And uh, I mean, of course, we, we always have to put our feet on the ground as Marigo was, was starting to so, tell us. So I'll be honest with you that we've probably left a, a trail of dead bodies. We've definitely, <laughs> we've definitely got into a lot of different markets. And I guess the interesting thing for us, one of the things we'll talk about tomorrow is, is some of the verticals where uh, we, we have seen gamification work after trying a lot of things. And I guess for us, it's about how do you carve out use cases where there are tangible business benefits Okay, so where we're actually really moving the needle for an organization. And when you've homed in on those, you know, how do we scale that? How do we deliver that to more organizations that have got the same problem? Great. Manish, yeah, how's your so, experience been? Okay, so I, my background is software engineering. So I've been doing programming since age 12. That was 1982. And um, uh, Self-Driven is actually the, the third startup that I founded. And I've seen technology come and go. And I think in the terms of um, industry analysts called Gartner, they, they, they describe the, mature, the maturing of technology um, using something they call the hype cycle. So, um, they, they, you know, in, in the hype cycle, uh, all new technology will, will start with um, people having very unrealistic expectations of what the technology could do for them. An example being blockchain and AI right now is at the height of that expectation. But um, what comes next is really a lot of failed experiments, perhaps, because expectations are too high. Um, many of those projects and all that uh, fail to meet expectations. So you start seeing a lot of um, high failure rate of projects. And I think that's where gamification is at the moment, based on what uh, Marigo has shared with us. But if, if the industry, you know, the, the practitioners could um, learn from that experience and consolidate what works and what didn't and also focus on how we could deliver tangible business value. And I think gamification as a whole will, is on the way up again. Because I do believe that there is, there is a place for gamification in the business world. It, uh, um, I think um, this whole idea of behavioral science, behavioral economics has gained a lot of traction in the business world. In fact, two person have won Nobel Prizes for, for behavioral science. And in my view, gamification is really the user experience aspect of good behavioral science. Mm. And because behavioral science work, we can make gamification work. That's it. I'm, I'm sure we can make gamification work. And there was a, a, a trend of, of the things that you were saying. Uh, you left a bunch of dead bodies and you say we've been learning. Juliet has also been learning a lot. And that's, that's one of the, the great reasons for us to be here and to be sharing this knowledge. I know many times in the, in the industry, you have to sign an NDA that says you cannot talk about this to your wife or you'll be going to jail or whatever. <laughs> but uh, as much as we can share, that's something that helps the community grow. And again, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here and that's one of the reasons I do the, the podcast for, so that we can be sharing these experiences as, as often as we can and we can learn from each other. Even again, we could be competing with each other in, in a very you know, healthy competition, but that, that's it. these experiences that we're sharing here is something that is, I think is of great value. And in the sense of, of sharing, I, I also shared with, with, uh, with the people in social media, et cetera, I asked them if they had any questions for this awesome panel that we had today. And Chuck Sigmund from Amazon did have a question as well. He said, 
well, depending on where you're at, there are some organizations that can have some data as well from, from success cases, et cetera. But there's others who, at least internally, don't have that case. So basically his question was spinning around, how do you make the case, the business case for a, a company where that company has no data around how gamification works? How do you, how do you build that, that business case for, for them? I mean, we, our client base is large corporates. So we face that question you know, daily, daily yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the way that we approach it is um, not necessarily uh, from a gamification works point of view, but more from a broader point of view, which is in and around behavioral science and the way the brain works. And so when we're discussing, you know, learning platforms or learning environments, we, we, might, we might put in for, for large clients, what we're saying is, what have you got now? How many people are actually engaging with the platform? So typically on you know, learning management platforms or micro mobile platforms, people might be logging in you know, five times a year if they're lucky. On our gamified platform, it's about five to 10 times a week. But on our mobile app, our new, our new gamified uh, um, learning platform, the Knowledge Arcade, it's up to sort of 14, 15 times a day. So we don't say, you know, let's have a conversation about gamification. We say, let's have a, a, a conversation about the platforms that you're using now and the impact that they're having on the organization. And then let's look at how much money you're spending and let's work. And then going back to the point about behavioral science, learning is not a moment in time. And if we want that knowledge to transfer into behavior, people need to be engaging with that, that learning platform on a daily, daily basis. Um, and so our conversations aren't about necessarily is gamification the right thing, it's more in and around how do we get your budget to work most effectively to change the learning culture and meet your objectives, rather than the solution is gamification. You're looking for people to actually learn beyond saying that you're using gamification. So again, yeah. fighting the whole fad thing that we're doing it because it's the latest and the greatest. Yeah. It's actually getting people to get these results that you're, you're asking from them. Mm. I don't know if, if you had a, a similar approach. Yeah, I, so I, I guess it's about, so, so for us at, at Three Radical, we, we make sure we, we bake, we hard bake measurability into what we deliver. Because, you know, gamification projects live or fail based on you being able to prove, particularly if, if people are, don't have the data, you need to be able to prove the uplift that you've generated. So that's, 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 that's one thing that we really focus on. The second thing is also, uh, talking to Marigo at lunchtime about, you know, when you start a gamification project with a, with a new company, um, I'm sure they've got a lot of preconceptions about what they want to deliver. They might want to sort of get, you know, bore the ocean. You have to tie it back to things that are going to move the needle for, for, the, for the business and the company. Okay, so a couple of great examples. One that springs to mind is, um, I'm sure this is affecting everyone in the room, um, GDPR earlier this year, where overnight people's email databases were wiped out. Okay, so all of a sudden you're trying to use email to, to, to market to people it has disappeared. So, so how, do you, how do you cut through that? You can't email them anymore. So, you know, that's a clear business problem. If an organization has lost half of the, of the people it can contact, well, you know, that's going to have a direct impact on bottom line. So it's picking use cases like that where we can apply gamification to it to actually sort of move the needle. So in that case, organizations we worked in there, uh, we've used gamification to give people a compelling reason to opt back into marketing. Okay, so it may be in retail, uh, we use a mechanic in store where there's a, a clear value exchange. So you get to play a very simple uh, digital game where you might win a digital voucher um, for that particular retailer. Uh, the quid pro quo is you get that reward if you have opted back into email marketing again. Okay. So again, you know, very specific use case, uh, because we bake measurability into there, we can see how many people are doing that activity, how many people have signed up, um, how many people have gone on to visit that restaurant or that store within a particular period, two or three months after that, that first touch. Okay, so that's the thing, you know, we've heard some great pieces this morning about, you know, play testing and prototyping. Um, the one thing that's been missing for me so far is business outcomes and business goals. Be very clear up front how you're trying to move the business to an organization, make sure you can prove it afterwards. And then what that allows organizations like ourselves, if we're sort of in startup mode, is to create reference or case studies that then we can go to Amazon and we can say, Somebody else, yeah. we haven't done it for Amazon, but look, we've done it for these companies and we did it because we've gone through this and we can measure the outcomes. So that would be my takeaway on that. Right. I agree with Juliet and, and Will. I think, I think um, being able to 
um, deliver something tangible from a business outcome perspective is, is important. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, I, I, I mean, the way I would like to share my experience with you is that um, I'm actually two different persons sitting here. I'm a gamification practitioner, but in an, in an alternative universe, I could have been a CEO that you're trying to sell gamification to. Because prior to um, founding Self Driven, I was running a tech company with 400 people. And uh, I actually self taught, self, self -taught myself gamification because I want to solve my own engagement problem. If I haven't taken that step, I'll be sitting here asking you to pitch gamification to me. <laughs> so so let, me, let me give you a tip on what goes on in the CEO's head, right? Uh, I, will, I will give it to you straight. <laughs> First and foremost, learning without performance is not a business, it's a university. Engagement without performance, it's pampering. So what CEOs really care about is how do you translate everything you say into performance. And performance can be defined very simply as three things, only three things. If it, if it doesn't fall into these three things, I, um, the meeting is over, I don't want to talk to you <laughs> as a CEO, right? Either you tell me for what you are trying to do with gamification, you can explain it to me in the terms of increased revenue, reduced cost, or better compliance to lower by business risk, then I will buy gamification from you. Yeah. That's fantastic. That makes sense. I, I don't know if we have any questions from, from the audience. I would be quite keen on, on seeing if you have, yes, we have a question over there. And then we have another question over here. So again, I, I, I could see the value here of what is being shared here from your experiences for other people, and let's see what else we yes. can... Yes, well, I have a question for Mr. Lum, because he told me you were interested when it's about, um, well, the, the three items you just mentioned, but what about employee engagement? What if, if that helps to engage the people more? Uh, I think we, we have gone through the learning the business, in, in, in running a business, we have learned that in some kind of business like ours, where knowledge and collaboration and innovation and initiative is important and uh, part of our team's job very often is to make um, decisions on a daily basis. So they have to be engaged to do those things right. right? So we, we understand as, as, as business owners, as CEOs, that engagement is important. Uh, but having said that, uh, I, uh, through my own interactions with other companies and all that, I have seen companies with highly engaged workforce that doesn't translate to better business performance. So in, in my view, engagement is, is important as part of the process, but the end goal is always about how do we improve business outcomes first. Secondly, I think as a, as a CEO running a, a company and a, a, in the knowledge-based economy, if you like to call it, or in the industry 4.0 world, um, you also, it's also in your interest to make sure that your employees are successful. Uh, uh, but success has to be defined uh, uh, um, in a way that uh, is also relevant to the business, you know. So, so I, hope, I hope that answers your question. I, I'm guessing that one of the things here that, that again, seeing it like a bit from the outside, is you're talking about two things that are, are steps. Because employee yes. engagement is actually a step that you're looking for to get something else. Yeah. And what, you're looking, what the CEO is looking for is the business performance. Of course, yeah. if you can relate one to the other and explain how the employee engagement is going to move the needle in the other side, maybe that's exactly what, what the, the CEO would be looking at yes. into so in this case. I could give you an example. One of our clients, a multinational global consulting company, they try really hard in making sure that there is a good employee experience and they, they get very high engagement scores every year. But they still talk to us because despite the high engagement scores, they have fairly high employee turnover. So that, that engagement score, it's a proxy indicator or something else, but it's not necessarily the business outcome that you want.
We had another question over here, Vasilis. Thank you very much for, for being the person to bring the microphone from one side to the other. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so, first of all, I totally agree with, uh, with Munch. Uh, and that's something that came up earlier, though, with the rise of playful experiences. Aren't we falling into the danger of gamification becoming fuzzy again? Yeah. Because uh, League of Serious Play, is, 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 we all see the value in it. But for a, for a CEO that is totally uh, focused on results, it's easy to it's it's hard to prove that it has actual results. So and with that, I, I'd like to segue into asking uh, Juliet. Uh, particularly in uh, your learning, uh, it's uh, easy. Well, I wouldn't say it's easy, but there are a lot of uh, platforms uh, tackling the the the, the e-learning uh, medium and making e-learning process more engaging and more more challenging. But uh, in what way are you connecting it to the, the bottom line, to performance itself? Are you, are you able to measure performance uh, of the employees before uh, introducing your platform and after introducing your platform? Because the, I, what I see that gamification can bring into the equation is actually making learning measurable and uh, m being able to measure the impact of uh, uh, what you're introducing into the, into the, into the process. I mean... I think we've obviously been trading now for about 14 years, so we have a lot of uh, data to support the more learning people do, the more uh, you know, profitable, particularly in the area of sales. Um, but I would also say, by the same token, that some, sometimes it's not necessarily about uh, immediate... Uh, return on investment. So for many of our clients, they're doing uh, culture transformation projects. So BT, for example, would be a, a good example of a business that is going through huge amounts of change and it's basically trying to communicate out a whole different way of basically managing their, their business and that needs to be done consistently across the globe, you know, in 25 different languages or whatever. Um, and so to filter that down is going to take a long time. Um, we also have pla um, you know, platforms out there, for example, for L'Oreal. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a community where a community doesn't currently reside. So these people will be you know, selling L'Oreal products through, throughout travel retail, but they work in shift patterns. So it's a, it's a, they're not around their colleagues a lot. And so one of the things they're trying to do is they're trying to create global communities that feel local in order dis to discuss uh, things that people that work for L'Oreal are passionate about, like beauty. So it's not necessarily these big, large chunks of e-learning. It's actually about creating you know, a learner community that is passion passionate and engaged and wants to learn so that ultimately it does trickle down to the bottom line. You know, one of the frustrations that, you know, uh, there is in, in learning is, you know, that learning happens in a moment in time. You know, one piece of school me learning is going to go out there and it's going to transform everybody's, you know, idea of fishing. So the, we were talking to GSK a couple of, uh, about uh, six months ago. They spent two million quid rolling out a global program to, to, for anti-fishing. And then they got a, a third party university to come in and basically measure the effects of this piece of, you know, this, this learning. And what they found is, is absolutely zero change in the pattern of, of people's behavior. And the reality is, is that whether it's manual handling or whether it's you know, uh, security or whether it's GDPR, you know, we as human creatures you know, don't have one learning moment and then we are transformed. It is about creating you know, a community of learners that basically can show how they're applying that learning and all of that, that kind of stuff. And that's where I think gamification can come in because it allows people to be rewarded and be part of a community over a period of time. Um, so, yeah. Can I, what I, can I yeah. just add? I think it also comes down to the metrics again now. So one of the things that we found, I'm sure you found it as well, is that when you gamify training, you know, what you, you quite often find is, is going back to your point about what are the three things. Well cost comes into it. So what we found is that when we, we've done some, some work out in, in, in Australia, with National Australia Bank, we found that people actually complete the training about three times faster than they would if it wasn't gamified. So there's a cost saving there that, that people are doing the training faster. 
Um, there's also the piece then that they'll quite often do it in their own time. Okay, uh, you know, there's sometimes some interesting pieces around that, around, you know, you know, people feeling compelled to do it, but people, if you give them the ability to do it on the bus on the way into work, you know, in a fun way, they'll do it in that way. So, so you can still tie it to a bottom line. It could, it could be sort of, uh, you know, cost-saving in, in that way as well. So I guess it's picking your metrics to support port your case. I think also the other thing that you touched upon about people not having a sort of single moment of learning... I think the other thing that, that gamification is really good at is the ability to, you know, a lot of us will have been on <clears throat> some sort of uh, classroom course where we're expected to take on loads of content in a really concentrated period of time, like you guys coming to this event for two days. How do you put it into practice? So where gamification is also really good is the ability to, to give people a burst of that learning content, but then actually drip feed extra gamified content as they get back into the swing of their jobs, okay? So they have the the stuff they're supposed to learn, and then they literally maybe pledge to, to actually put that into practice. And again, gamification can be used to embed that as well. So again, um, you've got some cost savings in terms of the speed of the training, but also you've probably got a greater chance of that training being recalled and used because you're following it up with, a, with additional content and additional learning when they're back on the job. And again, you do that training because it makes sense for the company. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you're not doing training just because. You're, you're doing training because it makes sense for, for the company, for Whatever, and, but one, one thing I wanted to jump into, and, and I've, I've seen it as kind of a trend of what, what we've been talking about it as well, looking back on the other talks, is we're here uh, at this conference, many of us are, are, are into the gamification world already, so one of the, the main things that you, we might be asking ourselves after, of course, seeing how some things have failed and how, how can we stop failing, is what can we do or what are you doing as well to help move gamification forward into the future? So what, what do you think both what we can do, not, not in your place, but in our place, and what are you doing to help the industry move in the direction that we all want to? I mean, I think as far as you know, our product development roadmap, it really is about delight and excite. So that's pretty much it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to put as many gaming mechanics uh, you know, into, uh, to act as options effectively. So we're not saying you need to use all of them, but what we want to do is have those learners to be delighted and excited. And we also want it to look really beautiful. So those are the types of things that, that we're doing. I think you know, the innovation in gamification in terms of the fundamental mechanics is, is absolutely vital because let's say we've been working with you know, EE for five years, flight center for seven years. You can't have the same gaming mechanics and you can't expect the same things to work over and over again. So this is why it is very, very important for us to come up with new mechanics and new, you know, ideas that, you know, our global admins can use, switch on, switch off, in order to make that learning, you know, journey compelling and exciting. I think also the other thing is, is where we take our steer from is very much consumer technology and if the learners love it. So, you know, we want the learners to turn around to the L&D department and go, wow, this is like the best thing. It's so much fun. It's really something that we, you know, we love interacting with. Um, because if we can make them delighted and excited about learning, then it makes everybody's job a lot easier. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'd echo that as well, that um, yeah, it's, it's constantly innovating and extending the, the, the raft of capabilities that you, that you bring to bear. I would definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, <clears throat> I guess the other thing is also, we talked this morning about the, the, the sort of slight thing that we, um, we come up against. I think it's the, um, I think somebody called it the shiny new things, isn't it? So all of a sudden gamification is old hat and it's all AI and, and it's blockchain. So I guess what it's about is making sure that we embrace those as technologies as well. So, I mean, certainly for us as an organization, we're already thinking about how AI can be used within our, within our solution. So um, another use case that we've done in the past is, um, again, in a sort of marketing space is where uh, we've, we've uh, literally been able to create loyalty schemes where people walk around the city, they're near to a particular retailer and they get pinged a gamified offer for that particular retailer. Um, so it's as simple as, uh, as a potentially applying AI to that. So if you've got maybe 6,000 possible offers that you could be giving somebody, it's about how you use AI to score and predict uh, which of those offers might be the, the most appropriate one to, to present to any given <coughs> marketer. So it's about, as you've said, in making sure we, we continue to extend the range of 
uh, capabilities, but also then adopting and, and, and sort of embracing new technologies yeah. as they come along. And also, uh, I mean, not, not to like, pat ourselves on the back, but gamification comes from games, and games use AI every day Absolutely. since, yeah. since yeah. pretty long ago. So that's a, another thing that we need to incorporate and, and maybe show the value of, of, of that, the fact that it's there and that we, we're able to use it. Right, right. <coughs> I, I, my, my take is, I think for, for us to move forward, um, like, like I agree with um, you know Juliet and, and Will here. You know we should try to get rid of that whole idea that we sell gamification as as a, a shiny new object. You know, say so, hey hey, there's something new here. Look at this. You know, I think I think the mistake that uh, some of us have made in the past is we, we try to take people, the audience, out of their job into a game. And I think instead we should be what we should be doing is. Putting, into the, putting the game into the job that they are doing every day so that yeah. it's not intrusive. It doesn't stop you uh, uh, in your tracks because you need to pay attention to something shiny. It, it, it is just a better experience that you go through every day that engages you. Right? So, so I think we, we, will, we will be successful as an industry when gamification is so pervasive that people don't even know it's there. That's great. Mm. Good reflection. <laughs> that, that's one of the things. Absolutely. And again, it's bringing it back to the whole gamification, not just as a, a game mechanic, you dump in here, you dump in there. It's as a strategy that, that we've, been, yes. we've, been, we've been talking about. Do we have more questions? Will over here. And then I can't, see, I can't see who that is, but there's somebody <laughs> in the middle aisle as well with a question. Yes, I've got a question. Um, and I, I'm <clears throat> tapping into your last comment on uh, bringing gamification so intrinsically in our daily lives that it makes everything pervasive. Um, but it, to my mind, um, jumps the recent developments in China where you get points for being a good citizen. And it, it reads like a, an absolute horror story. Uh, which I'm not accusing you of being the brain behind the big Chinese <laughs> point the scheme. The evil genius. But yeah. I, 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 I feverishly like to bring this sort of ethical side of our business into the conversation, mm. if you permit me. I, I think and the and it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I think it's the basic thing that we have to keep remembering is, is we, we, we put the player or the audience at the center of the game rather than somebody else. And I think that the case in China is... is you know, not done that way. Let me just put it, right? So, and that's where thing, things go wrong. It becomes a system to, to control, to monitor, to manipulate. So it, it's, it's not, it's a point system, but it's not good gamification. So, so I, think, I think at the heart of good gamification is it's all about a value exchange, okay? So particularly in marketing, um, what we're trying to set up is these, these micro-value exchanges whenever a consumer decides to engage with a brand. So we invite them in to engage, and we have to give them a reason to engage because, you know, gone are the days where a brand can just shout and tell people to do things, you know, so that and a, the value exchange can be just inherently making it more fun. Um, you know, we, we at Three Radical believe that, you know, as well as symbolic rewards, that, you know, the gamification purists would perhaps say you should purely rely on. We, we also mix real-world rewards, so, you know, there's a tangible benefit for that. So I definitely, I definitely think, I definitely think that's, that's, that's at the crux. It's about that value exchange. Um, without that value exchange, then you're right. Um, I guess the other thing is kind of interesting, where's he gone? I was talking to Pete at lunchtime about the, the ethical uh, dimension as well. So um, as you'll hear in my talk tomorrow, um, we're, we're actually going to talk about um, working with online gaming companies. And by that, I mean pay-to-play gambling companies, which are, might be a few oohs and ahs and sort of sucking in of teeth at that point. But um, it is really about, uh, I guess, a continuum, isn't it, gamification? So... You know, we, we work with some gaming companies, we work with some charities where they're still trying to drive people to, to uh, spend money on a lottery, for example. So again, that's a, you know, another part of the continuum. Uh, continuing on from that, you could actually say that all marketing, where we're trying to use gamification to change behavior, well, you know, we're actually trying to change people's behavior. But as long as the value exchange is in there, so if people engage and, and do what we want, we give them something in return, then I think, you know, I think that's fair, and clearly your example where I guess perhaps staying out of a state prison in China is the value exchange there. Um, probably not quite so fair. So that would be my take on it. You have any comments? 
I mean, I would just say, you know, gamification is kind of like sugar. We all need sugar to live, but if you eat a lot, you're going to get diabetes and die. So it's, it's a question of how you apply the mechanics, the game, gaming mechanics, um, rather than the mechanic itself. You know, I mean, there's nothing inherently good or bad about gamification. It, it, is, it is how you, how, how you apply it. Um, Again, not, not to jump in, but you, I, I always use the, the, the example of you, a hammer is an incredible thing to build a house. You can't build a house, well, at least some years back, without your hammer. But you can take that same hammer, you can stand here and break her skull. It's something I don't want to do, but some people do that. Thanks, I appreciate that. I just want to say thanks. <laughs> I don't have can one, gracefully. Um, but, but we can do exactly the same thing with many, many, many tools and strategies and things. There is an intent behind it, and Anjay is somewhere around here. He, he, he also has a, a, a commitment and, and the, the ethics code that, that he wrote, which I invite you all to read it and to, I, I pledge to it. But in general, it's, it's, the intent is very important. And of course, there's also always the next step that we have to take into inspiration. The next question was... Last question? Okay, well... Okay, small question. <laughs> I'm really interested in making the business case to CEOs, you know, the gamification business case, and you mentioned three points, like um, uh, how to uh, increase revenue or reduce cost, and there was another point, and I didn't hear uh, it. Lower correctly. risk. No risks. Low ri lower risk. Lowering the risk. Lowering, Lowering business risk. Yeah, Legal. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> right. That was an easy one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> three points. <laughs> yeah. I think it was uh, just on the same uh, point that you mentioned. So you going to CEOs and talking to them and trying to say this is useful uh, and giving them a business case. I wonder if we should maybe challenge the gamification community here asking what if we actually invited the CEOs to actually use gamification to actually get them to think about what do you really want? I mean, apart from those three things, right? Because then only if you want it to get pervasive, then only will it get pervasive. And I think it's the job of us as consultants or whoever that is to basically raise the banner of gamification and say, this is what we think we should be going, and that also talks about ethics and all, rather than saying, what should we do for you? Uh, so I'm going to be controversial here. I completely disagree with that. <laughs> I so, love that. <laughs> so Controversial part. You've got to start with what the... You said it. If it's not one of these three things, you've got to start with what the company's trying to achieve. Is it, is it in marketing? Is it trying to acquire more customers? Is it trying to cross-sell more to them? Is it, is it trying to retain them? So... And absolutely, gamification could be techniques to deliver that, but you've got to be laser focused on that, on that business goal. So absolutely, you can weave in gamification. You can use whatever language you want, but unless you've got a very clear picture of what you're trying to deliver, and then you frame it in whatever language is, or is going to be appropriate for that person with the outcomes that they're looking for, your project's not going to succeed. So, so sorry if that sounds a bit harsh, but that would be my take. Uh, just to, 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 to give it the small, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, both of you, there's what the client needs and the, what the client wants. You have to always find a balance for you two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think also the other thing is, you know, we work in the, the learning development space and, you know, we have, um, you know, inherited in learning tech from, you know, the classroom arena that um, people are being educated if they turn up. So we have this idea of, you know, basically if you can run a SCORM report, then we know we've done our job. And, and, and I think one of the challenges that, you know, the L&D industry has as a whole is, you know, they are told that their job is to train people. They're not told their job is to increase performance. Mm. And so we have a lot of learning technology out there and, you know, many, you know, serious games that mm. are ticking that box of, yes, people have been trained, up, yeah. but the performance is not that dial is not, is not moving up. So yep. I think what people say they want and actually what that business needs, sometimes there's clearly water. So, you know, you can turn up and have a conversation with L&D professionals. They'll go, you know, I need an LMS. I need a really, really exciting, you know, gamified experience to pull my people through. But actually that's not what they need. What they need is they need a set of learning to turn into a new set of behaviours. And that's a whole different, you know... World. And, and, and you, you've been talking about the university. I work at a university, <laughs> and I do think that there's many things that we can and should change. So definitely, <laughs> we can improve and we can go forward. I think our timing is up, and Michiel is... Was the hint that out. clear? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much the, to the panel. Thanks to you for bearing with us. Um, it's been a pleasure, at least for me. Thank you, Ron. Will Stewart and Rob. <laughs>